nothing like his presence and there is absolutely no other place in the world that I would rather be right now than in his house, his presence, worshiping him with his people. I'm thankful to be together today. It's good to see you. We welcome you to Christian Life Center. As has already been stated to every guest, thank you for making the decision to worship with us today. So thankful for his anointing. I believe he has prepared us and led us to this place to receive the word that he has given me for you today. There is nothing more important in this hour than hearing the voice of God. There's a lot of voices. There's a lot of information and disinformation. There's a lot of chaos and confusion. We've got to hear from God. We've got to hear the voice of God. We've got to be receptive to what God is speaking to us and then to not just be a hearer of the word, but to be a doer of the word. Praise God. We're going to turn today to 1 John chapter number 2. As you're returning to your seats, let me remind you of our invitation cards that we have out the display in the center of the foyer. New invitation cards with our new schedule. You have options here at CLC, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock on Sundays. As Brother JP mentioned, one final online only service this Wednesday and then We'll be back in the building for Wednesday nights, our graduate service and reception this coming Wednesday. And then the, once we get into July, we'll be having our children's ministry and youth ministry on Wednesday nights and children's ministry on Sundays, both of our services. We also have a new app. So if you already have our app, you need to update your apps. That little app update uh, icon that has like 100 or 200, that number, whatever it is, the number of apps you haven't updated yet, you need to click on that and at least update your CLC app. And if you don't have the CLC app, you need to go find it. Christian Life Center Heath, you can find it for uh, Apple and Android. We hope to see several of you this evening, 5 o'clock, Brownsville, as we relaunch our daughter work this evening. Such a, a good time connecting with the community yesterday was able to, to just, I, I believe, make a good impression on that community as we provided gift bags for all the homes, I believe 80 homes right in the Brownsville community. Several wonderful conversations. Talked to a lady who taught Sunday school in that building 60 years ago. Well, that was pretty neat having that conversation with her. Returning to 1 John, this is the first of a series of three letters written by John the Beloved, the writer of the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, written near the end of the first century. There is a consistent theme in these three epistles which he penned. He's writing to the church and warning them against false doctrine and false teachers. There were heretical teachers proclaiming counterfeit teachings in an attempt to corrupt true Christianity. And John was sounding an alarm. He was declaring the word of the Lord, trying to get the attention of the church. And he gave us the antidote. He gave us the answer. And this is really the heart of my, my message. It's very simple yet powerful admonition that John gave us. If we love God, love truth, and love people, it takes care of a lot of issues. It takes care of a lot of problems. If we'll just love God, love truth, love his word, and love People, a lot of the chaos and confusion and issues that we're dealing with in our world today would be taken care of if we would just love God, love truth, and love people. So 1 John chapter 2, verse number 18, Dear children, the last hour is here. That statement has never been more true than it is now. The last hour is here. You've heard that the Antichrist is coming and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. The signs of the times declare it. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 1. Dear friends... Do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. 
Not every voice is speaking truth. Not every voice is speaking truth. We need a spirit of discernment. If ever there was a day with so many voices and so many access points that our culture and the adversary of our soul, so many access points that he has to communicate his message. We have to be sure. We have to be careful. He said, test them, test the spirits to see if that spirit comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. That spirit is here at work in the earth right now. We're living in that space of time that the Bible defines as the end time, the last days. And this spirit of Antichrist is at work in the earth today. We have to be aware of the spirit. We, we have to understand its purpose and its tactics. I'm preaching today about the spirit of Antichrist. I've never preached a message before about the Antichrist. You're getting the first one today. The spirit of Antichrist. It's a spirit that we must engage from a spiritual perspective and with spiritual weapons because the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not fleshly, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and high places. So we must fight from a spiritual perspective and be filled with the spirit of God if we're going to be victorious over the spirit of the Antichrist. Anybody want to be victorious? Would you pray with me right now that God would speak to us, that he would give us revelation and understanding today? Lord, we thank you for your holy presence today. God, we have discerned that we are standing at the edge of heaven. We sense him your anointing and your presence. And I am praying, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds today to be receptive to your word, that we would hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church today. God, that we would be able to discern the spirits that are at work around us, to discern your spirit, what you're speaking, what you're doing, the way that you are leading and directing. Help us, God, to be sensitive to your spirit and to yield ourselves, to surrender ourselves today to your word and to your spirit. If that's your desire, would you lift your voice and give God praise and give him thanks right now for his word, for his spirit today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. I am far from being an expert when it comes to eschatology, the study of final things, the last days, the end time prophecies concerning the rapture of the church, final judgment, the resurrection, the afterlife. This term refers to the eschaton, the teaching of scripture that relates to the consummation of God's purpose for the church and Israel and all of humanity, including the physical earth. The final events in the divine eschatological plan for the end of the world. I do believe, however, that I have a firm grasp on the basics, specifically the things that we know. There is a lot that we don't know as we look at prophecy in Scripture. We're looking through a glass and darkly, and I will readily admit, I, I have not spent a considerable amount of time studying those points of eschatology that are up for debate and those that are open for personal interpretation. But I do believe, I'm praying, that the rapture of the church will take place before the seven-year Great Tribulation. No matter what your theological standing may be today, is there anybody that would agree with me? I would rather be raptured out of here before the great tribulation. It is during that tribulation, we do know this, that the, it will be the time of the Antichrist. He will rise to power and produce a pseudo-peace through subtle manipulation using a charismatic and persuasive personality and raw satanic power that will produce miracles, signs, and wonders that will be how he is able to deceive the masses. However, I am thankful to know that his fate is sealed. We can read the back of the book and we do know the end of the story that the Antichrist, our adversary, will not prevail, but there will be a time that he will be conquered and God will arise and cast him into the lake of fire forever. 
Over the course of the past century, there have been many who have speculated as to the identity of the Antichrist. Various prominent public figures, men like Adolf Hitler or Mussolini, Henry Kissinger, Mikhail Gorbachev, Saddam Hussein, and probably some who are asking questions even about our current president. Who is the Antichrist? I don't know today who the Antichrist is. If you were hoping that in this message I was going to reveal who that is, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't know who the Antichrist is. I do believe he's alive today. I do believe that we're that close to the coming of the Lord. We're that close to the rapture and to the tribulation that he is very likely alive and at work in the world today because I do believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. However, I'm less concerned with the identity of the Antichrist and more concerned today with the influence of the spirit of the Antichrist that is at work in the earth today, this spirit that's trying to influence the church. The word antichrist means antagonist, rival, or opponent. It is to oppose, to be against, or to replace. This spirit is anti-Christ. It's not one of those words that, that, that is difficult to parse. The understanding, the meaning of the word. This spirit is anti-Christ. Christ. It opposes Christ. It resists Christ. It seeks to replace Christ. It is the spirit of our culture. It is a, a spirit that is chaotic and destructive. It is a spirit of anarchy and lawlessness. It is carnal and sensual. It feeds the appetites of, of the flesh and it is working overtime today. The spirit of Antichrist, you can feel it, you can see it, you can sense it around us. There is tremendous spiritual and social upheaval and unrest. It has become abundantly clear that we are no longer a Christian nation. Don't kid yourself. I thank God for America. I'm proud to be American. But, but we are a long way removed from the Christian foundation upon which our country was built. We live in a secular humanistic society that has a very obvious militant purpose to eliminate and eradicate God from every aspect of life, to replace the Christ with a false Christ, to replace a true Christianity with a false Christianity, to offer a weak, impotent, ineffective, substitute, counterfeit version of God. And many today have what Paul defined as a form of Christianity. It has a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof. Church, we better wake up today. We better recognize the spirit of Antichrist is at work in the earth. We better wake up and realize we have to be aware of what is going on around us. We must discern the work of, of the Antichrist. His purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I want to serve the spirit of Antichrist. Notice today that it's not going to happen here. It's not going to happen in my family. It's not going to happen in my church. Would somebody make that declaration with me today? It's not happening here. We must be aware of what it is, how it operates. We know it operates in the world. We have to make sure it does not infiltrate and influence the church. Author Thomas Schmidt wrote a book, Scandalous Beauty, The Artistry of God and the Way of the Cross. And in chapter number six, on page 66, seems a little ominous. He writes this, a reading taken from the new and improved Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning of modern times, about 100 years ago, man looked at his universe, and it seemed without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of mankind looked over everything, and man said, let there be science, and there was science. And man saw the science that he made, that it was good, and with it he divided all things. He created a science to rule the day, all the things he could see, and he called it natural science, physics, chemistry, and biology. And he made a lesser science to rule the night, all the darker things about himself, and he called it social science, even psychology and sociology and politics. And man saw that it was good, and there was morning and evening, and the modern day had begun. 
And man divided all the things he saw, the waters above, the land, the waters below, the grass, the fruit tree, yielding fruit, the swarms of living creatures in the waters, the birds that fly above the earth, moving creatures of every kind on the earth, including himself, a higher primate distinguished from the other creatures, mainly by his ability to destroy everything. And man saw that all this dividing and classifying was good and the destroying was fine too. This all took several evenings and mornings and that got him up to the fifth day. And modern man said, T-G-I-F. But then he thought, wait a minute, what does the G stand for? And then modern man said, let us make God after our own image, according to our likeness. And so he did. And he blessed God and said to him, be distant and keep to yourself because we have already filled the earth and subdued it and classified it. And there really isn't a whole lot of room left for you, but you certainly are a pleasant thought. And then modern man planted a garden, and there he put the God he had formed. And he called the garden safe, respectable religion. And out of the ground of that garden, man made to grow trees that are pleasant to the sight and flowers. And he put fine buildings in the midst of the garden because good landscaping enhances property value. And the Lord man took God and put God in the building and said, God, enjoy yourself, but whatever you do, stay in the building. For in the day that you leave it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord man said, it is not good for God to be awake. Someone might wander into the building and find him and be frightened. So the Lord man caused a deep sleep to fall upon the God he had made, and he slept. And made, let, man laid him in a box inside the building and put a lid on the box and laid a curtain over it and placed tall candlesticks on top of it so he could come there from time to time to remember the God that he had made. Then modern man said, at last, I have expressed fully the mystery of life and the depth of my mind. I, I shall call this God personal, for out of my personality... He was taken. And there was evening and morning the sixth day, and modern man saw that it was very good because all this was done, leaving one extra day in the weekend for golf. I kind of like that part. What an incredible description of our culture today where man has attempted to make God in his image. Right. The mystery of godliness is God making himself man. But the mystery of iniquity is man attempting to make himself God. It is man creating a God that makes him comfortable and at ease with his spiritual condition. It is creating a God that asks nothing of you where you can come to church and clap your hands a little bit and sing a few songs and fold your hands and bow your head and walk out the door the same way that you came. That is the spirit of Antichrist. If you thought that was the kind of church that you were coming to today, I have bad news for you. This isn't that kind of church. This is an apostolic Pentecostal church. This is a church where we believe God made us in his image and he still transforms lives. He still takes the broken and men's broken hearts. He still sets free the sinner. This is the kind of church where you can be changed and transform there is a specific weapon that this spirit of the antichrist uses in order to accomplish its purpose it is the weapon of deception I want to give you a little more context from the scripture we read in 1st John I want you to notice some key terms and concepts first of all John says chapter 2 verse 18 the last hour is here you've heard antichrist is coming already there are many Antichrist that have appeared because we know this is the last hour. Verse 19, some have left our churches. They never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved they did not belong with us. There was something in their spirit that was anti what God was doing in the church. Our actions are a physical, visible representation of our value system, what we really believe and what we really value. He said in verse 20, but you're not like that. For the Holy One has given you, notice this, His Spirit, and all of you know the truth. He said, you have spirit and truth. It's spirit and truth that will enable you to discern the deception of the Antichrist. You have His Spirit, and you know the truth. So I'm writing to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. God, help us to have a spirit of discernment. Let me talk to our young people for a moment. Your pastor and youth pastor and parents don't have enough time to be able to make a list long enough to deal with all of the circumstances in life that you will encounter. 
doctor. We have to have a spirit of discernment to know between right and wrong, truth and error, truth and a lie, righteousness, holiness. We have to know what is right and wrong. We need a spirit of discernment. Verse 22, and who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. When you see me, you see the Father. So if you said, accept Jesus, you accept the Father. If you call on Jesus, you're calling on the Father. Because Jesus is the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's why on the day of Pentecost, they didn't baptize just in titles. But they baptized in Jesus name because Jesus is the only saving name so this is the spirit of Antichrist that wants you to deny the Christ of Scripture spirit that wants you to manufacture the Christ that fits your personal narrative Manufacture the Christ that supports your lifestyle with no change the Christ that is okay with you living the way you want to live every man is right in his own eyes, that's the spirit of Antichrist. A Christ with no surrender, no commitment, no consecration, no sacrifice. I've come to declare today that the Christ of Scripture is not a figment of our imagination. The Christ of Scripture is not man's response to its emptiness and brokenness. No, it is God's response to our need. We, were, we did not fashion God in our image. No, He made us in His image. The Christ of Scripture is not manufactured by humanity's inferior expectations. The Christ of Scripture is the mighty God who is manifest in flesh. This is the good news of the gospel. That God, the God of glory, the creator of the universe, would robe himself in flesh and, and walk this earth and feel what we feel and experience what we experience, tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. He would suffer, he would bleed, he would die. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, but he didn't stay there. He rose again on the third day. That's not a God that I created. That is the God of Scripture who's in this sanctuary today. You see, the spirit of this age wants a Christ without a cross. We live in a very unique culture where it's okay to believe in a God and believe in a higher power as long as you don't get too specific. As long as you don't say there's only one God and his name is Jesus. Culture wants Christianity without Christ and without a cross because the Christ that came in human flesh, the one who died on the cross, he calls us to deny ourselves. And take up our cross and follow him. So he says in verse 24, you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you'll remain in fellowship with the son and with the father. In this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. Verse 26, I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. I'm writing you to warn you about those who want to deceive you. You have received the Holy Spirit. That spirit of truth, that comforter who will lead us and guide us into all truth. And he lives within you so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. Now let me just pause here for a moment and clarify. Make sure everybody's on the same page. He's not saying you don't need anybody to teach you the truth. Or you don't need a pastor in your life to give you direction. If you back up to verse 24, what did he say? You have to remain faithful to the things that you have been taught from the beginning. What he's saying is you don't need a new revelation. You've already been taught the truth. You have the word of God. You don't need a new revelation that somebody is going to present to you, bring to you that is extra biblical. He said the spirit of God is going to illuminate the things that you've already been taught and, and give you revelation and understanding. Don't look for a new revelation. Don't look for somebody to give you a new truth. There is only one truth. His word has been declared. It is forever settled and it will never change. For the Spirit, that Spirit of truth teaches you everything that you need to know. And what He teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as He taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. I, I declare to you today as your pastor, you only follow me as long as I follow in Christ. If at any moment I begin to deviate from the Word of God 
or to follow a different spirit, to go a different direction. Please don't follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. The word and the spirit will always agree. God will never give you revelation that contradicts his word. God will never never give you direction. He'll never speak through a prophet. Paul said, though I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He said, I feel so strongly about it. I'll say it again. If me or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed the word and the spirit will always agree you've got to go to the word and make sure that the word confirms what you're feeling in your spirit we must know the difference between what is truth and what is a lie how do we know how do we comprehend and understand this keep reading we find broader context in 1 John chapter 4 where we read the first portion of this passage in our text. Don't believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. Test those spirits to see if they come from God. There are many false prophets in the world. Have a discerning spirit. Don't allow just anybody and everybody to speak into your life. Just because somebody is passionate doesn't mean that what they believe is true. Just because somebody is sincere doesn't mean that they're right. They can be passionately and sincerely wrong. Test the spirit. Confirm it with the word of God. Verse 2, this is how we know if they have the spirit of God. If a person claims to be a prophet, acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world. And indeed, it's already here. It's already working. The voices that you are listening to, do they line up with the word of God? Do they proclaim the truth of, of the word of God? Do they stand upon a foundation of truth? Are they proclaiming the truth of the new birth? You must be born of water and of spirit. You must repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus and receive the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues as the spirit of God gives the ability. Is that voice proclaiming truth? Are they proclaiming a holiness lifestyle in separation from the world, separation from the spirit of Antichrist? you got to make sure that the voices that you are hearing are in alignment with the word of God. Verse 4, but you belong to God, my dear children. You've already won a victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to the world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. Wondered before why somebody just wouldn't listen to my preaching. This is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of, of deception. This is, this is the test. This is how you discern whether or not someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Who are you listening to and who is listening to you? You see, carnal people listen to carnal people. And spiritual people listen to spiritual people. People who want to compromise their doctrine or their lifestyle will find someone who is willing to listen to them. They'll find a sympathetic ear. They'll listen to voices that will justify their behavior, voices that will assure them that they are okay. This is how we know whether or not someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. When your pastor is preaching truth, when you're confronted with truth, do you feel conviction and run to an altar? Or do you feel indignant and offended and head for the door? What is your response to truth? I don't stand here today, and I hope you understand where I'm preaching from in my perspective today as I declare to you the word of the Lord. I'm not standing here saying I've got it all together, got it all figured out like the Apostle Paul. I'm still striving. I'm still reaching. I'm still trying to get there. But I have a responsibility today to proclaim truth to you. I've got a responsibility. I've got to answer for your soul, and I'm going to take that responsibility serious today. I have to proclaim truth to you. Is the primary weapon, the chief weapon of choice used by the spirit of Antichrist is deception. It's deception. John would write in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 7, I say this, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging you, I am admonishing you to be careful because many deceivers have gone out into the world. 
And they deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. The spirit of this world, our culture, uses the weapon of deception in its attempt to control and manipulate in order to steal, kill, and destroy. This deception comes in many forms. Sometimes it shows up as self-justification. Sometimes it's self-righteousness. Other times it's self-sufficiency. But any of these manifestations will always end up in self-destruction. It is subtle in various forms, some that sound good and some that may even be good, but they are not good as a replacement for Christ. A social gospel has no power to save anyone. I am a strong advocate for treating everybody right and treating everybody the same. We must do that. We need to take care of those in our community as best we can. Physical needs, we do that through the vertical 196 and other ministries where we reach out into our community. But feeding somebody's body will never take care of their physical or their spiritual condition. We can't just focus on the physical. We have to focus on the, sp the spiritual. A social gospel has no power to save. Political power and influence will never save anyone. Earthly success will never satisfy and never be fulfilling. Anything that replaces Christ is antichrist. Even if your motives are pure and there's nothing sinful about the activity, if it is a substitute, if it is a distraction, if it is a diversion from Christ, it is antichrist. The most subtle and sinister deception of our day is compromise that is manifest as tolerance. The modern definition of this word has been twisted and perverted. I'm all for everybody being free to believe what they want to believe without fear of the government or the church or anybody trying to harm them, hurt them because of their belief. But there is a sinister manifestation of this definition and this movement of tolerance that would dictate that every belief is valid and true, that everybody's truth is right for them, that every man is right in their own eyes, and, and that every belief should be celebrated by everybody. I believe that every individual has the right to, to believe what they want to, but not every belief is right. Not everyone's truth is right. There is a, a, a sinister direction of this spirit that begins with tolerating that belief but it is never satisfied there that that toleration moves to acceptance but it's never satisfied with just acceptance it wants you to celebrate its belief but it will never stop there until you are willing to denounce what you believe that is the path of the spirit of antichrist and this movement of tolerance that really has become like a religious movement first to tolerate then accept them, then celebrate, but ultimately to denounce them. What you believe deception is the weapon of the spirit of Antichrist. And we must be aware what's going on around us. We can't allow the spirit of tolerance to cause us to denounce what we believe. Matthew 24, Jesus was asked about the end time and the first words out of his mouth were a word of warning. Take heed that no one deceives you. Over and over again, as Jesus talked about the end time, he made this declaration, make sure that nobody deceives you. Many are coming in my name saying, I'm the Christ. They'll deceive many. Notice verse 10, many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. He said, in the, in the last days, offense will come. It's amazing how often deception follows offense. There's a hurt. Somebody does you wrong. Somebody says something. Maybe somebody doesn't say something and you feel like they should. There are unmet expectations. And where there is hurt and offense, it opens the door. It gives a foothold to the enemy for deception to come. You are deceived if your thoughts, 
motives, attitudes, words, actions, and lifestyle don't line up with the word of God, and yet you are justifying your behavior. If you're making decisions without praying and fasting about it, it is likely that you are deceived because you know what God's going to say. You know the direction that God is going to give you. If you avoid talking to your pastor or spiritual authority about things that you're struggling with or major decisions that you are about to make, if you avoid those conversations, It is likely because you are deceived. You know what would happen if you went to the word of God or spiritual authority, your pastor, you're going to hear truth and you don't want to hear truth. You want to stay in your deception. If you're hiding anything, it is likely that you are deceived. If there's any area of your life where you have not been open and honest and transparent with God, with your spouse, with your parents, it is likely that you are deceived. The scary thing about deception is that you don't know when you're deceived. That's why you've got to have a pastor. That's why you've got to have a pastor in your life. I do not speak that from arrogance today, but from responsibility. You have to have a pastor. You have to have somebody who will speak truth into your life. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. We've got to have a pastor. My father is my pastor. I'm submitted to Bishop. If I ever get out of line, I want him to call me out and call me down and tell me that I'm out of line. And I'll be the first one to get in the altar and repent and ask God to forgive me. We have to have a voice of truth who will speak into our lives and help us to see the blind spots. We can't see blind spots. That's why they're called blind spots. It takes somebody from a different perspective who can see the blind spots of our life and speak truth into our spirits. We've got to have the word of God because our heart is deceitful and wicked. The Bible says we can't even know our own heart, but the word of God, it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It knows right where we're living. It knows what we need to hear. That's why we must be filled with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. John gives us the antidote to the Spirit of Antichrist. He he proclaims, I, I wish I could read all of 1 John. I encourage you to go home and read the entire letter. Read 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Second John and Third John are just a chapter long. It won't take you too much time. But First John chapter two, verse fifteen. This is the Passion translation. Just before the text that we read earlier, he said, "Don't set the affections of your heart on this world, or in loving the things of the world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. The carnal mind is enmity with God. It fights against God." For all that the world can offer us, the gratification of our flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, and the obsession with status and importance, none of these things come from the Father, but from the world. This world and its desires are in the process of passing away. But those who love to do the will of God live forever. Those who love to do His will, not because it's easy or comfortable, but because it's right. Those who love to do His will even when it hurts, even when that conviction sets in, those who love to do the will of God will have everlasting life. So he declares to us, don't love the world. He continues on. I won't read the passages, but in 1 John chapter 3, he talks to us about loving righteousness. He continues in 1 John chapter 4 and talks to us about loving God and loving people. He said, how can you say that you love God who you can't see when you can't even love your brother that you can see? It's the antidote. It's the answer for dealing with the spirit of anti-Christ. Love God. Love righteousness. Love truth. And love people. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul was declaring to that church some things about the end of time. He was giving them understanding about what would take place. This spirit of The Antichrist would take place during the time of tribulation, but it gives us some insight to the spirit that we're dealing with today. He said, now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun or that the coming of the Lord had already happened. He said, that's a false doctrine. Don't believe them even if they claim to have had 
a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there's a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember that I told you about all this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly. Right now, it's at work in the earth and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. But the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He'll use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they'll be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. See, deception is often disguised in the form of entertainment. I'm not preaching against all entertainment. But I think we have to be careful when it comes to the things that entertain us. Because it said there would be those who are destroyed by deception because they refuse to love and accept the truth and they're condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. The trap was entertainment. What they entertain. Because you see, what is entertaining you, you eventually will entertain. If there's something that's entertaining you, you are entertaining a spirit. You're entertaining their spirit. Every person, everything that's entertaining you, you are entertaining that spirit. If you entertain somebody, you host somebody. You invite them into your home. You invite them into your family, into your life. When you entertain something or somebody, you are hosting that. So my question to you today is this. What spirit are you entertaining? Are you entertaining the spirit of Christ or the spirit of Antichrist? Are you, are you entertaining the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception? What spirit are you hosting and entertaining? I want you to stand with me today. First John chapter number five, as he begins to conclude his final portion of this first letter, he said this, we know we love God's children if we love God and we obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. He said his commandments are not too challenging, they're not too difficult. In fact, when you consider the alternative. Yes, there is sacrifice involved with living for God. Yes, you have to take up that cross and deny self and carry it. Yes, there may be, there's a level of commitment. Yes, there's surrender, all of those things. But that beats the alternative of being broken and, and a life destroyed by sin broken by addiction, broken by, by relationships, broken by this world and the spirit of this age who desires nothing more than to destroy you, to destroy your family, to destroy your faith. Yes, there are some commitments, but it's not burdensome. Yes, I do have to surrender, but it's not burdensome. He said, if you will love God, if you will keep his commandments, if you will love people, if you will just be obedient to God, you can defeat the spirit of Antichrist. Christ, you can be assured that you'll overcome a spirit of deception. So I want to ask you today as we prepare to enter into a time of prayer, I want us to do some personal introspection today. I want us to just pause here for a moment and allow the word of God and the Spirit of God to examine us. I, I trust that while I have been preaching His Word today, that the Spirit of God has been talking to you. And if there is any area in your life, while I was preaching, you felt that, that prodding of the Spirit of God. You felt that nudge of the Holy Ghost. Okay, the preacher just hit something. Okay, the Spirit of God is dealing with something. So I ask you today, 
Is there any area of disobedience in your life? Is there any issue with a brother or a sister that you need to make right? Is there an area of deception in your world? Are you justifying any carnality? Are you justifying any compromise? Is the spirit of anti-Christ at work in you? Is there anything, any attitude, any motive, any thought, any behavior, anything that opposes the will and the purpose of God in your life? Is there anything that has replaced Christ in your life? Have you given room? Have you given space to the enemy, the adversary of your soul, the spirit of Antichrist? I want you to close your eyes all over this sanctuary right now. I sense the Spirit of God. That gentle, loving, merciful Spirit of God who is reaching into hearts and lives today telling you, you don't have to stay the same way that you came. You can be delivered. You can be set free. You can be restored. You can be made whole today. You don't have to carry that guilt and shame and condemnation. I rebuke the spirit of condemnation. I rebuke that spirit of guilt and shame right now. You don't have to carry that anymore. The Father of all mercy and grace is here in this sanctuary right now. And He is reaching for you. And He wants to wrap His loving arms around you and embrace you with His mercy that's new every morning. He wants to embrace you with His amazing grace that is sufficient to make up for any deficiency in us spirit of God is reaching right now you can be transformed before you leave this service today you can be renewed and made whole today in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus I speak against the spirit of deception right now. Somebody who is battling deception in your mind. Somebody who is struggling against that spirit of antichrist right now. I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. We are victorious through the word of God and the spirit of God. There is a a deceptive spirit that's telling you it's over. There's a deceptive spirit that's telling you you're not going to make it. There is a deceptive spirit today that's telling you there is no hope, no future, no purpose, no ministry, no calling. But I rebuke that spirit. The spirit of truth is saying, I love you. I have purpose for you. I've called you. I've got a future for you. There's hope. In the name of Jesus, I want to open these altars right now. If there's anybody that the Spirit of God is speaking to you today, if there's anybody the Spirit of God is drawing you today, and you want to come kneel down at this altar and just lay your life down and say, God, here I am. God, I'm going to open my heart and my soul to you today. God, I want you to search me. I want you to know me. I want your word and your spirit, oh God, to search my heart, search my mind, search my spirit, and transform me today, God. Come on, if the spirit is speaking to you right now, if the spirit is drawing If you're not comfortable coming to the altar, you can make an altar right there where you are. If you're not comfortable coming, stepping out of your pew, you can make an altar where you are. You can kneel down at that pew and you can make it an altar of sacrifice, an altar of commitment right now. God, here I am. God, if there's any disobedience in me, reveal it to me. God, if there's any deception, help me to see it. God, search me. Know my heart. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, let your word and your spirit search me today, oh God. The spirit's calling. Come on, the spirit is calling. The spirit of God is reaching right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.
Yes, God. Yes to your purpose. Yes to your will, God. Yes, I surrender. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, search me and know me. God, purify my heart, my mind, my thoughts, my motives. Oh, God, purify me with your word and your spirit. Let your blood wash over me, oh, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I need you, Jesus. Somebody, open your heart right now. I'm appealing to your spiritual passion to cry out to God for transformation today. To try out to cry out to God for transformation, for deliverance. God, help me to see myself. God, give me a spirit of discernment um, to discern the voices that are speaking into my life. Um, maybe there's some voices that I need to eliminate. Um, maybe there's some people I need to eliminate. Um, maybe there's some entertainment that I need to eliminate. Um, maybe there's some places uh, that I need to eliminate. Um, maybe there's some activities uh, that I need to eliminate. Um, maybe there's some rebellion that I need to eliminate. Um, maybe there's some... Re- re- Resistance to the spirit, resentment and bitterness that I need to eliminate because it's anti-Christ. It's anti-Christ. It's resisting the work of Christ in me. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Ministry team, I want you to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost right now. Elders, prayer warriors, people of faith. I want you to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost and let the Spirit of God minister to you throughout this altar, throughout this sanctuary right now. Hear the voice of the Spirit. Hear the voice of the Spirit right now. Come on, you got to shut out every other voice so you can hear that still, small voice. Oh God, we've got to hear your voice. We've got to hear your voice, God. Whatever it takes, we have to be saved. God, whatever it takes, we have to be saved, God. Help us to hear your voice today. Oh, yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Oh, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Come on, if there's any hurt, If there's any offense, if there's any disappointment, if there's any unmet expectations, you gotta be careful with that hurt. You gotta be careful because you open yourself up to deception. You open yourself up to deception. Jesus, I need you, God. I need you, Jesus. I need you, 